some songs uh, are worship to God. They're like a, a prayer. Some are declaration. They're prayers that are about him. This, this next song we're going to sing is, is like a, a song to God. It's a prayer. And so wherever you are in your living room, with your family, by yourself, I encourage you to just close your eyes and be alone with God. You know, you can be alone with God uh, in a crowd. And so I encourage you to do that and, pr and, and sing this song, maybe out loud, maybe in your heart, uh, but, but just worship him. Sing this song to him. Let this song, let this song be a, a song that you sing to Jesus this morning. Open space for you to come 
hearts open. Do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. Lord, what we're saying is we'll, we'll be responsive to what you do and to what you say. We want to be in step with you. Lord, that's our heart's cry today. Oh, that's the best thing we can do. That's what we were made to do and made to be. And so, Father, I pray that you'd honor this prayer in every household, uh, every individual that sang that, that prayed that. Lord, that's our heart cry today. And Lord, we respond to you also and say, we will do what you're saying. We'll be doers of your word. Thank you, Lord, for your love that's undying, that's unconditional, that's unending. Lord, thank you that we never did anything to make you start loving us. We can never do anything to make you stop. And I pray, Father, not you give us ears and eyes uh, and, and a heart to hear and receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Cornerstone, well, well right now we're going to uh, take a moment. We're going to talk about our giving, talk about offering. Uh, I want to thank you for continuing to give. Uh, we, we're not uh, given here in, in person. You can still mail a check in if you want to, uh, to our address, 1745 East 18th Street. We appreciate it when, when you do that. Uh, thank you for walking in obedience, but we've tried to make it as easy as possible uh, to give online through our app, through online, uh, through our, our, our app, through the, the, the uh, website, and you can text to give by texting Seastone Give, one word, Seastone Give, to 77977. The church goes on. The church hasn't stopped. And so we thank you for your obedience. Thank you for your giving. This is the first Sunday of the month. And so that's a, a month that we always focus on, uh, on missions. Uh, many of our missionaries are either stranded because uh, they can't leave the places they are or, or they've been made to leave the places where they're uh, ministering. And so uh, our, our, your monthly commitment towards missions uh, continues and uh, we continue to support them each in every month. So thank you, thank you for your faithfulness uh, to that, to, to supporting the, the missions through the Faith Promise Pledge. Uh, we are making a difference all around the world. I just talked to one of our missionaries, uh, Neil and Danette Childs. They just flew back. They caught a, a, a medical flight out of Niger, uh, and they're going to be with us in a couple of weeks uh, to share about the things that God is doing in and through them there. So I'm really excited about that. I hope that you will uh, join us on Wednesday nights. We just had uh, our second, la uh, this, this last Wednesday, our, our outdoor family service, worship and prayer night. Uh, and it's been awesome just to be together. Uh, an incredible time for the, the body of Christ, just to sing together, just to be together. It's so good just to, to really to see your faces, to see each other, see each other talking to each other. So bring your lawn chair and we'll even have, we'll have some of the metal chairs uh, that you can use too, but just be here 7.30 on Wednesday nights. Everybody from nursery uh, to our oldest senior saint is there. And uh, so it's for everybody. And so uh, we'd love to have you there. This week, it's really special because we're gonna honor uh, our very first graduating uh, interns. So uh, from, from uh, we're so we're extremely excited about that, but that's gonna be the, the service this Wednesday. You don't wanna miss it. It's gonna be an awesome celebration. So we hope you be there. I'm gonna pray for the offering. Father, we thank you that we, uh, we get to be a part of what you're doing, not just in our community, but across the world. And so we pray for our missionaries today. Many that have had uh, to, gone to go to other countries, some that had, have had to come back to this country, some that are just locked and can't leave. Uh, I pray, Father, that through whatever it is, they're going to see your hand moving and working through them. They're going to see the vision that you have, have given them uh, come forward. And so we pray that we'll hear the great praise reports that you're doing, even through COVID-19. Thank you, Lord, that we get to, to, to be a part of it. Uh, use these funds, Lord, so that somebody that doesn't know you right now will know you very soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, we're going to get into the Word today. We are in our series, and uh, I think this is part seven of our series, uh, and, and I, I just really kind of, in a way, don't want it to end, but uh, this changes everything. Uh, and, and, and today the, the title is, 26 words. Now, my message is not going to be just 26 words. I wish I could be that succinct, but uh, it won't be. Uh, I've got a lot of things to say about those 26 words. Uh, but, you know, we have, if you're doing that Bible reading program with us uh, throughout the year, we have been in the Old Testament now for uh, going on eight months now, and we still have two more months left of reading through the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is wonderful, but man, I want to get into the New Testament. And so um, part of this series is, 
is, is that, us getting into the New Testament and, and just diving into uh, the, uh, what Jesus did because he came to change everything. He came to change everything from the moment that he stepped onto the scene uh, as an adult to the moment that he gave his life uh, a ransom for the world, to save the world. And, and so um, we want to uh, kind of focus on that. If we can kind of... Uh, um, um, kind of measure uh, Jesus' life with all this Old Testament stuff because it was this Old Testament stuff that made way for, but it was what he came to change. And so, uh, uh, you know, we left off Jesus. He was at the height of his popularity. Uh, things are, are, it's unbelievable. Things are happening. They're like the Beatles. Uh, Jesus and his disciples are like the Beatles come to America. Uh, and so everybody kind of assumes that Jesus is end games, that he's going to come into Jerusalem, and ta-da, here I am. I am the Messiah. He's going to proclaim himself as the Messiah. He's going to reestablish the nation of Israel as a kingdom. He's going to kick Rome outside of the, the borders, and, uh, and, and they're, he's going to restore Israel to the days of King David and Solomon. And really, that's what everybody thought. That's how they'd grown up. That's how great-great-great-great-grandma thought. That's how great-great-great-grandma thought. That's how great-great-grandma thought. And, and all the way down. So this is just the way they're brought up. It's their culture. That's what people thought. But, but there were some people that understood. The people that were really kind of um, the, the most discerning, uh, the people that would look and see what Jesus was doing. They looked at what he was saying. And they thought, uh, something is different here. Uh, because he spoke with in, incredible uh, authority. He had incredible authority, um, but he refused to take control. And, and uh, he, he almost immediately won the crowd over when he came onto the scene, but yet he refused to take the crown. He had extraordinary power. He had extraordinary influence, but he refused to use that power and influ influence for his own sake. So that's kind of where we are. And so we're going to pick up the story. Where we're going to hang out today is in John 3. So if you get your Bibles out or open them up or turn them on, that's where we're going to be uh, all day today. And it says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish council. Now the Jewish council was uh, the Sanhedrin, which was kind of like the uh, Supreme Court, if you will, of Jewish culture and Jewish law. They, they kind of represented themselves to Herod and to Rome and to, to those authorities. They, they would uh, represent Israel in those kind of matters. And, and they did have some authority um, that was under Herod, that, that if, if there was things that had to do with their culture, things that had to deal with, with uh, their religion in particular. And so it's interesting that, that John uh, actually gives the name of this guy because what John is saying to us what John is saying to the people that he knew would be reading this immediately after it was written or dictated he he said uh, fact check me go ahead and check Nicodemus you guys all know Supreme Court guy we, you'll know who he is you can check this out and so John John says that he came at night now we don't know why we, he came at night maybe it's because he was so busy during the day because he was an important guy maybe it's because it was hard to get to Jesus uh, you know Jesus had people just just crushing in on him all the time uh, maybe he just didn't want to be seen because uh, of the, the position he had and in the, the reputation that Jesus had. But anyway, we know that he has an appointment with Jesus this night. Somehow Nicodemus gets this encounter. It was a purposeful. He set out to have this encounter with Jesus. It wasn't just, just happenstance. Nicodemus shows up, and I'm sure he had questions. I'm sure he had several questions, um, but really he never got a mask because um, this is what he, he comes up to Jesus like this. He says, he came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. Now, a couple things. Rabbi, he was just saying, hey, it's a term of respect. There was other rabbis, but they were, it was a respected profession uh, in what they did. Uh, uh, but he's saying, we know for certain, we know this, that you have come from God. Now, that's a, a pretty daring thing for Nicodemus to say. He's admitting, hey, you know, I don't get everything you're doing. Um, you don't fit into a box, Jesus. You don't really fit into a category. You, you, uh, you're, you're not acting very Messiah-like in so many ways, um, but there's just something we can't deny. We can't deny that you have certainly come from God because of the things you do. That, the, the reason we know that you've come from that, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing. No one could perform them. Now that's important because when we think of things, uh, we think of miracles, we think of just like miracles. But if uh, these people that were paying attention for someone like 
like uh, the, the, the Jews of first century, someone like Nicodemus, they would understand these are signs that point to something. They weren't just indiscriminate healings. They, they weren't just healings to healing. It was, there, there was a sign. It was pointing to something. It was pointing in a direction. And Nicodemus was an educated man. He understood that. He understood that, that Jesus was doing something. It was pointing to something. He was going somewhere and he was pointing to something new. Uh, and that's what really bothered the, the religious leaders. And so it says, no one could perform. No one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. And so uh, that's kind of the setup. Nicodemus kind of, uh, kind of trying to butter Jesus up for what's about to come next because he's probably got some things he wants answered. But something about Jesus intrigued Nicodemus because usually when they come to question Jesus, they would come as a group. They'd have a group of them they would come and, and kind of question. But Nicodemus comes by himself. Something had intrigued him. And so um, that's his setup. He's there. He wants to ask Jesus some things. But then uh, Jesus does what Jesus always does and he kind of gets to the starts asking questions himself or he starts answering questions before people even start answering them and Jesus replied very truly I tell you no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again so here's the the deal okay unless you're born again Nicodemus like uh, hey listen I know why you came Nicodemus I know what you're going to ask um, but there's some things I, I want to say to you um, and and I know really you don't want to be seeing me anyway so let's just cut to the chase I know what you're thinking I have a different angle on things uh, I have a, a, a different category my category seem to be much larger than yours and in, in, in uh, the, the people of Israel so let me just get to the heart of this Nicodemus let me get to the bottom of this Nicodemus and and just tell you I tell you no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again uh, and of course this is confusing to Nicodemus um, you, uh, I mean what do you mean can't see the kingdom of God I'm Jewish and people in, in the first century Jewish people in Israel uh, I mean they, the kingdom of God in, in Israel that's basically synonymous so I can just look around and see the kingdom of God uh, and for for uh, these, these people that that's the way they thought and it, and of course I'm going to see it I was born into it I, I, I'm, I'm going to see it so I don't know what you're talking about Jesus um, and, and you know being born again and, and Jesus says yeah you literally um, have to be born again or what the uh, some trans translations say is born from above and so Nicodemus uh, you're welcome to the uh, the kingdom of of Israel um, and, and Jesus says you know kind of playing with him so so Nicodemus is probably like um, kind of laughing a little bit he's seen Jesus enough no okay he's messing with me a little bit but um, he says rabbi how how can someone be born when they are old Nicodemus asks surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born so Nick is probably frustrated I'm sure he's a little bit confused. Uh, he came to talk about something else, and now all of a sudden they're talking about being born again. And uh, it's uh, just, you know, how conversations with Jesus and the religious leaders would go a lot of times. And Jesus answers, I, I, Jesus, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God. No one can enter the kingdom of God. Okay, wait a minute. First, I couldn't see the kingdom of God. Now I can't enter the kingdom of God. You, you know, uh, you say, I won't recognize the kingdom of God. Of God, he, and here it is again. Unless they are born of the Spirit, unless they're born of the Spirit, by, of, of, and so uh, Nicodemus, like, what, what, where, where is this going? What are you talking about? Flesh gives flesh uh, gives birth to flesh. Uh, you know, Jewish people give birth to Jewish people. Romans give birth to Romans. Greeks give birth to Greeks. That's how it works. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Uh, your, you, you, your, your flesh of the kingdom of Israel. Congratulations. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But Nicodemus, spirit, gives birth to spirit. So this is co co confusing for Nicodemus. Uh, and there's something more that's, that's taking place here. Um, you can be born of the kingdom of Israel, Jesus says. You can be born of that. But really, if you want the kingdom of God, uh, if you want entrance into God's kingdom, 
You, you Nicodemus, of all people, should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The, the, um, the, the wind blows wherever it pleases. And again, he goes off into another illustration. Nicodemus is thinking, man, I'm never going to get my questions asked. And he's probably uh, uh, answered, and he's probably kind of reeling at this point. The, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone one who is born of the Spirit. He's, you know, he says the Spirit is like the wind. You know there's a wind. You can feel the wind. You can see the effects of the wind. But you don't know where it came from. You really don't know where it's going. And so it is with the Spirit of God. And so uh, what he's getting at with, with Nicodemus, and, and again, you give Nicodemus a little bit of a break. It's his first century Jewish context. And of course, that's what he has to draw from. That's all he has. It's all that he's, he's lived in. And so uh, Nicodemus, he says, you've got to understand, many years ago, you'll, you'll understand this, God made a promise to our forefather Abraham. He made a promise that he was going to make him a family. He was going to make that family into a great nation. Uh, and he was going to bless the nations of the world through this family. God made this exclusive covenant with these people. And Nicodemus gets all that, and Jesus is talking about that, uh, because the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel was a means to an end. It was a means to an end. And that end is that the entire world would be given access to enter the kingdom of God. Well, for the Jewish people, that would just blow their mind. That changes everything. There will be a people, the scripture tells us, from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation that will be invited into the kingdom of God. They'll have entrance into the kingdom of God. The entrance to the kingdom of God requires uh, a, a second birth. It requires a spiritual birth. And so that's kind of hard to understand. This is the first time this has really been talked about. Nicodemus didn't have a category to, to house any of this. And so you got to kind of understand that's where he's coming from. How, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. And that a, is a great question. In other words, how did I miss this? And, and then again, uh, Jesus kind of leans in. Come on, Nicodemus. Everybody's looking to you for guidance. You're Israel's teacher. Jesus said, and you don't understand these things? You of all people need to understand these things. Well, the conversation goes on. Nicodemus is bewildered. But here's one of the things about Nicodemus. He's not resisting. He's not running away. He's not accusing, which what happens a lot with the religious, religious leaders in Jesus. Uh, he's like some of you. You know, he, he, he just doesn't get it. There's a lot of questions, but he's open. We sang about being open. He's open. He's not resisting. It's like, you know, I want to understand, but I'm just not getting it. Have you ever felt that way? I know I've felt like that before. I'm just not getting it. And then Jesus goes into to something that would be common ground for he and for Nicodemus. Uh, and, and he talks about something. Now, this is something we're about to, to mention in his next verse that Nicodemus can grab onto. He says, just as Moses. Okay, Moses, now now we're talking Moses. Now we're talking covenant. Now we're talking commandments. This is something that he could sink his teeth into and he could have a conversation. But it says, just, and of course Jesus takes a turn where he, Nicodemus wasn't expecting. He says, just as Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. And, and so, wow, I didn't see it going there. And again, Nicodemus is like, Okay, well, I do know that story. I remember, I've taught that story. I remember the people the, of Israel, they're, they're coming out of, of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They're going to the promised land. And the snakes start to bite the people. And the people are getting sick. And some of the people are dying. And so uh, the, the, uh, 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 God has Moses build a, a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And if anybody looks at the pole, then they will be healed. They'll be saved. And so uh, that, you know, hey, I get that. I, I know what we're talking about now, Jesus. So, Jesus goes on, the Son of Man must be lifted up like, like a bronze snake on a pole. Is that what you're saying, Jesus? Now, once again, Nicodemus like, okay, wait a minute. Son of Man, now that's code for Messiah. That's what you're talking about here. Son of man, that's code for the one that we have been waiting for and waiting for and waiting for. The one that's going to be our deliverer, our savior. That's uh, what you're, you're talking about here. And if you put a man on a pole clearly, 
because the scripture says it in the Old Testament, um, of which was not the Old Testament at the time. It was just their, their scriptures and the law and the prophets. The, the Old Testament says that cursed is any man that hangs on a tree. And so that cursed by God, you're telling me now, you're saying the Messiah is going to be cursed by God. The Messiah is going to have to suffer this does not compute. It's is, is, is just so hard for him to, to grasp this. And Jesus continues. He says that everyone that believes may have eternal life in him. And again, Nicodemus is like, wait, 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 wait. Eternal life? I mean, I know how you get eternal life, Jesus. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's what you do. You follow all the commandments, and then you have eternal life. That's, that's how you get eternal life. You do what Moses said to do when he came down from Mount Sinai. We've been doing that for, uh, for, for generations, and, or at least trying to do that. So let me see if I get this straight. Everybody, Jesus, is going to have access to God. That's a new one. Uh, uh, and, and everybody, because of this Messiah that is going to be, suffer and be put up on a pole, everyone will have access and availability to the kingdom of God. And, and so you're saying the, this Messiah that we've been waiting for is going to be cursed by God. He's going to be put up on a pole. I just, I just don't get it. And so um, John understands what's happening in, in this uh, scene right here. And so um, John is, is telling the story. And he understands the importance of this moment. He understands exactly what is happening. And so he starts to editorialize. He kind of pops out of the story to kind of explain what's happening in the story. You know, we do that kind of thing all the time. We, we tell stories. Uh, and he's doing the same thing because he knows right here, because he was there at the time, Nicodemus didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Because here's the reality. At the time, and John was there, John didn't understand what Jesus was talking about in those moments. He didn't understand either, but he came to understand later. And this is so important. It's so weighty. It's so good. John wants to jump in and, and, say, and, and tell us so that we'll understand. So he pulls out of the story, uh, and, and the gospel writers do this all the time when they want their audience to kind of understand something that, hey, we, Jesus was telling the story. He was telling this parable. He was doing this. We didn't understand at the time, or they didn't understand, but this is what it really was. And so um, this is what's happening in this verse. So he pauses, uh, pauses the story to make sure those of us who are reading the story really grasp the significance and the importance of what's happening here. Because Jesus was pointing to something that hadn't happened yet. It hadn't happened yet. Nobody has a category for this. Nobody has a prediction of this. Suffering and dying, stuck on a pole, Messiah. This is brand new. He came to change everything. Nobody's looking for that. It's on nobody's radar at the time. That's just a bad ending to the wrong story as far as they're concerned. It doesn't, again, doesn't compute. compute. So John tells uh, in his own words what Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus, uh, and, and what Nicodemus couldn't possibly understand what Jesus was talking about because it hadn't happened yet. We kind of get, how could you be so dumb? But we get to, to know, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. We get to be on this side of the, the resurrection to understand all this. Uh, but, but John, uh, for, for him himself, he realized, hey, I didn't get it when Nicodemus didn't get it either. Um, and this is such an important conversation. I don't want anybody to miss it. And so here's the coolest thing. Little did John know. John didn't realize. John didn't think in his mind, hey, I'm writing the Bible right now. No, he didn't. He just knows I got a story to tell and I got to get it down. So he either wrote it with his own hand. Most likely he dictated it to someone else. And he said, this is what I, I want you to say. And he dictates 26 words, 26 words that have reverberated around the world ever since, in every culture, uh, in every language, uh, 26 words that survived the empire, 26 words that survived the temple, 26 words that have changed the world that his friend came to save. So he pauses from that conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. He pauses there, and it's like he's saying to you, it's like he's saying to me, that the, the disciple, John, what he's saying is, you see, you see, this is what I want you to understand right here. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Nicodemus, uh, he can't get out of his Jewish framework right now. And John thinks, I couldn't either. Um, and, but, but of course they couldn't. I can't blame him for that. But John's saying, I don't want you to miss the story. I don't want you to miss. I want you to understand what Jesus is trying to explain to Nicodemus. Uh, and it's so important 
for God so loved the world that he gave. And, and, and so um, he hadn't given yet. So that's, again, why Nicodemus can't figure this whole thing out. It's on nobody's radar that the Messiah would suffer like this. That he gave his one and his only son. And then he struggles to try to figure out, how do I say this? How do I say this next? And it's kind of some awkward uh, uh, wording that he has. Um, but John's just saying, okay, I got to get this right. I want to explain this. It's not whoever, it's not, it, it's not whoever believes that, not whoever believes that. It's that whoever believes. This isn't about facts. This isn't about believing facts. Um, there's, there's no Greek word for trust. So he's just talking about believe. It's just believe that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John had no idea in this moment the significance of all of that. He knew this is super important. He didn't know that he was writing the Bible, probably the most famous scripture in all of the world. John writes this, uh, he, or, or again, dictates it, um, and, and he, he writes it in Greek. He doesn't write it in Hebrew. He doesn't have it written in Aramaic because Greek is the language of the world, and he wants everyone to know about this. John seemed to know uh, more than anybody else that this is a message. Jesus uh, it gives a message and lives out a message that is for the whole world, uh, for, for the people of that time and the people of a time to come. G uh, uh, John understood that. So well, let's get into the language of the whole world so the people would understand, for God so loved the world that he gave. That's what John wants to get across. And John says, okay, before I get back to the story, there's one more thing I got to say because we're going to miss this and it's important that we don't miss this whole thing. And again, this is, you know, after resurrection. So John kind of understands. He sees the whole picture. I want to make sure you get this because this is what G Jesus was trying to communicate to Nicodemus. This is what it was. Nic Nicodemus' whole worldview was that when the Messiah comes, he's going to throw the invaders out. They will be discluded and we're going to be okay. So John adds these words in verse 17. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God didn't send the Messiah into the world to judge the world. God didn't send his son into the world to correct sinners and tell sinners uh, all the things that they're doing wrong. He didn't come on the scene of an accident uh, and, and lecture those that had been injured. That's not what he did. That's, that's not what Jesus did. But I've done that. I know that the church has done that. But Jesus didn't do it. He's like an EMT worker. Have you ever been around when an EMT person comes? They, they don't care what the background, they don't care why a person's there. They just go to work on fixing the problem, assessing what's wrong and fixing the problem. That's, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't come, John says, to condemn the world, but he came to save the world through him. So he shows up like this EMT worker. He goes to work and he assesses and he realizes that the world needs a blood transfusion. So he uses his own. And suddenly we're thrown back to day one. Do you remember John the Baptist on the banks of the Jordan River? He, all the people are there. Some people are thinking he's even the Messiah. And he says, no, it's one's coming, one's coming. I'm just paving the way for him. I'm just preparing the way for him. He's coming. It's going to be any time, any day. He's come. And Jesus comes up over the hill. John looks up and he sees him and he points to him. He says, look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so that's, that, that's where we are. And the disciple John's writing this. It's like, oh, man, we should have seen it. We should have known it. We should have recognized it all along. We should have been able to put two and two together, but we didn't. But I want to make sure that my readers get this before we get to the end of my letter, before we get to the, even the end of the story with Nicodemus. For God did not, uh, for God, uh, not just Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. That's what he, he did. So uh, when you love, this is what you do. You give. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, there it is again, whosoever believes. Whosoever believes. See, you didn't become a Christian because of faith. You be became a Christian because of all the evidence that points to the facts that Jesus is who he said he was. This is why you became a Christian. You don't become a Christian because of faith. You become a Christian by faith. There's a big difference because placing your trust in Jesus, that transaction, 
That is how you get born again. That is how you enter the kingdom of God. That whosoever believes in him won't be lost, won't perish, won't fall away, won't get lost in the shuffle, but they will have eternal life. You'll be born again into a brand new family, a, fa a family where you have the privilege to call the Father your Father, to call the creator of the universe your Father. Father, you'll be born again into a new family. Years later, there was another Pharisee. Uh, this Pharisee claimed to be the greatest Pharisee of all. That's Paul. He tried to actually end the church. He tried to put the church out of business. And uh, he looks back after the resurrection, and after he had a chance to meet Jesus uh, on the way to Damascus, on the road to Damascus. And he says, this is how I see it. It's this whole thing of God's inviting us. It's, it's like an adoption process. But you're, you're not only uh, the one doing the adoption, you're the one being adopted. And here's the thing, you can choose whether you're adopted or whether you're not because of the work that Christ did on the front end of this whole thing. You make the choice. Now, here's a great way to explain John 3, 6, 18 to anybody. God loved and he gave. God loved, he gave. That's real simple. That's what that scripture is all about. That's what you do when you love. God loved, God gave. And we're, uh, so that, that's what we're supposed to do. We're, we're supposed to not just, not just believe, but to trust in. Not believe that, but trust in. We believe, and then we receive eternal life. God gave, we believe, we receive. God gave, we believe, we receive. You want to share the gospel with somebody? There you go. Eight words. God loved, God gave. We believe, we receive. That's what it is. Getting into the kingdom of God is not about do. It's about done. D-O-N. What he has already done. He did all the, heavy lift, all the heavy lifting. And he says, this invitation is to you to accept my forgiveness, my friendship, a relationship with the living God. What, what an incredible thing. Now back to Nick and Jesus for just a minute. We don't know exactly um, uh, what, what happens in this rest of this conversation. It seems like Nicodemus kind of wanders off. He's probably confused. Uh, he goes home to his wife, and she's like, well, what did he say? What did he say? Uh, not really sure. Messiah's going to be on a pole. And a lot of bad things are going to happen. I have no idea, really, what he said. But eventually, Nick got it, and here's how we know. Because after Jesus was crucified, Nicodemus was most certainly in the crowd. After all, his group is one that put this whole thing on. This group is responsible for this. So the, he's there. He's probably in the back of the crowd. All he can see are tops of heads. And then all of a sudden, lifted up over the top of all those heads, he sees. He sees the, that moment. Can you imagine that moment? Suddenly lifted up from the crowd over all those, those heads. He sees Jesus hanging there. And make, I wonder if at that moment it came to Nicodemus. He said, cursed by God and abandoned. Abandoned by his own people. He predicted it, and it's exactly what happened. I never would have saw this coming. When Jesus is dead, Nicodemus risked his his, at the very least, his reputation, and very, very much so, maybe even his life. He risked his life. Um, and and it's, he, the, the story goes that, that uh, he came with a, a man named Joseph of Arimathea, and they want to bury Jesus. They're okay, I, you know. Um, and John gives Joseph of Arimathea's name. Again, fact check me. Go find out about these people. You guys will know about these people. You can verify all that I'm saying about this. Find these people. They're still running around. Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus, uh, they're absolutely sure. They don't know everything. They, they didn't see it going like this, but they're absolutely sure that this man had come from God. They're sure of that. And they, it's not the end of the story they anticipated, but man, I don't know, but this man doesn't deserve to just be on a heap with other bodies. He didn't deserve to have his body eaten by the dogs. 
after he's crucified because it was against the law to bury a crucified person. So they go to Pilate and ask for permission to get the body. And they probably had to slip him some coins to, to get that favor. The Sabbath is about to begin. And so they take about 100 pounds of, of spices and things with them, which means they probably had some servants with them. Again, stuff that's easy to verify. Uh, they get to the tomb uh, that had never been used before. Joseph of Arimathea has given his, his family tomb for this. They prepare the body the best they can as they're in a hurry. And Nicodemus participated in that. Something happened with Nic Nicodemus. He was intrigued. And, and he, he goes to, to pay honor to Jesus' body at the very least. But he, he knew that this man had come from God. And maybe that's you. Maybe you don't have all your, your questions answered. Like Nicodemus didn't have all the questions answered, didn't understand. It was a confusing conversation at the very least that he had with Jesus. But you don't have to have all the answers. Joseph, uh, uh, Nicodemus didn't have all the answers. I certainly can't give you all the answers. Uh, but in this story, uh, I hope there's something that stirs your heart. Um, it stirred, stirred Nicodemus' heart. I hope it's stirring your heart as well. And uh, maybe you've heard it. You've heard the gospel. You've heard the story. You've heard the good news. you heard the story of Jesus over and over again. It's been years. Uh, someone's been telling you. You sort of kind of get it. You got a little bit of information, but you're just not sure. And just, uh, but, but slowly, but surely, maybe, maybe today you've heard it again. And it's just pushed you a little bit over that line. And you kind of, okay. I can believe, I can receive. So today, if you're like Nicodemus, I know enough about that Jesus came from God. I know enough about that. Don't have all the answers. That's not what I'm asking. Uh, then I want you to just inv uh, to, to join the invitation that John gives, the invitation that Nicodemus accepted, that Jesus came for the whole world, for everybody. This is the point of the gospel. It's the point of Jesus coming. I think that what John would say to you, what he says to me, and, uh, what, what I would suggest is do what Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus did, and millions and millions and millions of other people throughout the centuries have done. Would you be willing to believe? Would you just be willing to receive? God already loved. God already already gave you just believe you just receive what Nicodemus couldn't put together because it hadn't already happened and, and because we're on the other side of this so I, I want you to consider this invitation would you do that would you do that today would you do what Nicodemus ultimately did he considered that invitation he accepted that what John is encourage you to do in his letter that he wrote to believers what Jesus came so that we would have the privilege to do. Would you believe? Would you receive today? Could you trust him? Would you receive your Savior today? Would you rededicate? Maybe you've fallen away. Here's, here's our heart. We, we want to get to know you. We want to help you in this journey. It's, it's not a, a, a one-time thing. It's, this is the first step. It's the first step in coming back. It might be the, the first step. I remember the first step I ever took. My friend had preached to me, told me about Jesus. I had been to church. I knew the story. But man, I encountered the living Jesus, the real Jesus. And I, I was still even too proud to ask my friend to pray for me. So I went home and I kneeled in my bed. I didn't even know what to say. Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me my sins. And that started a process. But you know what I did? I told somebody. I called my buddy up and I said, hey, Neil. I just asked Jesus into my heart. I asked him to forgive me. And he started cheering. He sent me some stuff to help me out. He said, we're going to be praying for you. We've already been praying for you. We're going to pray for you some more. So that's what I, my commitment to you is. We would, we'd like to know. One of the things is just to confess what you just did. Just, hey, I just made a commitment to Jesus. So if you'd like to do that, you can call 925-522-8322. We'll get you the help that you need. We'll get in contact with you. You're not, not supposed to walk through this walk of faith on your own. So my encouragement is to text that. Text the word next. Uh, text the word steps. Text the word help. Or just give it a call. We'll get back to you. 
in 24 hours. Uh, we'd love to help you on the journey. Really, it's why we're here. Let me pray for you. Let me pray with you this morning. And the band's going to come. God, we are so grateful uh, for this message. I'm grateful that we get to live in 2020 where we can look back, where we can have the Old Testament, the New Testament, where I can kind of look and, and, and kind of study and, and know the story of, of Nicodemus. And I don't have to grapple with all these things like, what in the world is he talking about? I can see this. Lord, I thank you that you set somebody into my life at a time in my life when I was able and open to, to receive your word and your ways. I thank you, Jesus, that you never gave up on me. And Lord, I know there's people watching today that are in that same boat as me, that they're not right with you. But Lord, I pray that today would be the day, the first Sunday in August, Lord, that they would say, I I'm gonna get right with God. I'm Jesus, you did the work. I'm just gonna receive what you have done. I pray for them. Lord, I pray for strength. I pray for courage. I pray for protection over them. Lord, I pray for our church. Lord, that our church not grow cold. I pray that our, our people not grow uh, distant. But Father, I pray that through uh, this time of separation that we have, that we grow closer and closer to you and somehow even closer to each other. I thank you for your blessings on your people. I, I pray, Lord, your protection from the virus. I pray, Father, that we walk in divine health. So, uh, and I pray, Lord, for our leaders that you would give them a clue, give them wisdom. You said if we ask for wisdom, you give it liberally. You give it generously without finding fault. And so I pray for them. Even if they're not praying for themselves, I pray that you give them wisdom, depth of insight to know what to do. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that you have done the work and all we have to do is receive. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, we're gonna close out with a song then I'll come back and give uh, another little reminder announcement, all right? Let's sing. Just where you meet us, stick me there, stick me there. If you're looking for an offer, it's right here. My life is here, and I'll be your
Lord hears my life. What a bold song, what a bold prayer. It reminds me of Jeremiah. He said, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. And I pray that that's how we will be. Lord, make it like that. Lord, it seems silly sometimes, but I need to pray. Help me to love you more. Help me to not be distracted by the blessings you've given. And Lord, let me see you uh, in, in the people that are around me and in the situations that I find myself in. I thank you, Lord. Uh, help us to be difference makers. In Jesus' name, amen. Cornerstone, you are difference makers. You are. If you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, you are. We're here to make a difference, and I hope that I'll see you this Wednesday night. We're going to celebrate the graduation of some of our, our interns, and uh, this is going to be a, a great night of worship and celebration. 7.30, bring a lawn chair. We'll have some chairs here. Bring your mask. We're going to have a great time. This Wednesday at 7.30, we'll see you there, Cornerstone.